All right, yeah, so thank you very much, uh, Marcos, for the introduction. So I, I'm really happy also to be here again in person. Um, as Marcos said, I've attended uh, RUSAC a couple of times, and it's always really nice to come back here and share some of my group's uh, recent work with a more non-academic community, because obviously we typically focus on uh, very much academic work. However, I think that my group does very practical security work, so I'm again happy to share this with you today. So our talk today uh, is called, I want to deploy you, but my senses tell me to stop CSP's past, present, and future. But we, before we get to that, I first want to mention that this is not just me presenting my own work, right? but this is essentially work by both my group as well as a number of collaborators, both internally within CISPA as well as externally of CISPA. And uh, so you can see here me on the right-hand side of the left, si uh, left side of the slide. Um, and in case uh, you will not recognize Sebastian, he actually looks ever so slightly different now, so he's uh, a bald head now. Um, so you will see him in a minute on stage. So today's discussion will be about CSP, as the title already alludes to, right? Content security policy. And now you could ask yourself, why is this a topic that is relevant today? And before I try and answer this question, I'd like to talk about something entirely different with you. I'd like to talk about knives. So a knife can essentially be a very useful tool, right? You can prepare food with it, you can even create art with a knife. But using a knife, and I'm not opening this, um, just to be on the safe side, because what can happen if you use a knife, you can cut yourself in the finger. And even if you've done that a thousand times before using a knife, you can still cut yourself in the finger. This is not something that is of particular surprise to anybody here, but then the question is, if you use a knife, what is it that you'd like to have around? And I guess the answer is a Band-Aid, right? And the Band-Aid, essentially, it doesn't stop you from cutting yourself in the finger, but it does stop the bleeding, so it can mitigate the problem that you caused. And now I need to apologize to everybody here. I, I lied to you a minute ago. I said I'm going to talk about something entirely different and unrelated. I'm not. Because web development is very similar, right? You use sharp tools to create value. However, even if you've done it a thousand times before, you can still make a mistake. And one of the most dangerous, if not the most dangerous mistake you can make in particular talking about client-side web security, is to build in a cross-site scripting flaw. So if either the cut finger or the cross-site scripting flaw are untreated, they can both have severe consequences, right? You hopefully don't bleed to death from a cut to your finger, but at the same point, if you think about XSS, all your customers might be prone to attacks and account takeover and so on. And actually, CSP was designed to be the band-aid that we want to have when we use a knife when we build web applications. And it can be, or it was at least designed to be, a great band-aid. However, it has repeatedly shown to fail in practice. So what will we discuss today? So by the end of the presentation, we will together have seen how hard it is for developers to deploy CSP in light of, in particular, third-party code. But also, and this is where I hand over to my colleague Sebastian, learn strategies to circumvent the roadblocks that incur during CSP deployment and how you can even harden your CSP if you already have one. And to achieve this, we will first introduce some background and pitfalls of CSP, talk a little bit about the evolution of CSP, discuss, from a technical point of view, struggles of developers in light, in particular, of third parties, and then Sebastian will take over to highlight very important human aspects in CSP deployment. Now, before we talk about CSP, I want to briefly refresh everybody on cross-site scripting. I'm sure you all know this, but uh, indulge with me for a second here. So cross-site scripting is a vulnerability where an attacker finds, for example, some endpoint on the server, which just blindly echoes back, in this example, the parameter PL, payload. And so the attacker visits this page, um, puts this payload into this, uh, this URL, and then what the site reflects back to him is containing a script source from evil.com. So now the attacker knows, okay, I found a cross-site scripting flaw, which I exploited against myself. 
that's kind of lame because cross-site scripting means I can execute JavaScript, and in my own browser, I can just execute arbitrary JavaScript. So the second important step in XSS is that we need a victim. So we somehow need to make sure that some victim kind of visits this particular URL, and then the victim's browser will make this request to the web server, as you can see on the right-hand side, which contains the script in the request. We'll get the response back saying, you should load, dear browser, a script from evil.com. And the browser will say, well, I don't know if this is coming from an attacker, the developer. I understand HTML. This means I should download a script from evil.com and execute that as JavaScript. Right? And so again, this is obviously controlled by the attacker and then can be used to steal cookies, steal passwords, implement a keylogger, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And CSP mitigates this not by actually stopping the cross-site scripting vulnerability, but by making it harder and hopefully impossible to exploit it, because essentially it's a list, an allow list, of where, among other things, scripts can be loaded from. So the problem doesn't go away, right? We still cut ourselves in the finger, but we immediately apply this Band-Aid, which stops the exploitation in this case, namely through CSP. And CSP has been around for a very long time. Actually, it's 10 years now. And when it first started in 2012, um, there was this idea of, yeah, we can just restrict where scripts are coming from. It should be easy enough. However, let's look at whether or not it's easy enough here. Uh, let me check where my pointer is. There it is. No? Is that cool? No? Then I'll use the built-in one from PowerPoint. OK. So looking at uh, just this very, very simplistic website, OK? So we have here a script coming from add.com. And we know for a fact that this script from ad.com will always include a script from company.com. Let's assume that for a second, that we know this up front. And we have here a meaningful inline script. So that is a script that is just has the code within the opening and closing script tags, which was intended to be there by the developer. Okay, We're not talking about an attack yet. If we want to have a CSP that is functional, not talking about secure, that is just functional to allow these scripts to be executed, it should look something like this in the very first version of CSP, level one. With a script source, we need to allow add.com, we need to allow company.com, and we need to add this unsafe inline keyword. And given the fact that it's A red and B called unsafe, you already know that this is not a good idea. Because unsafe inline means, yes, you can allow inline scripts, but then there is no differentiation between an intended inline script intended by the developer versus one injected by the attacker. So we actually have to refactor this code to remove the inline script to even make it working with a policy that is not trivial to bypass, because as, uh, in the very second where there's unsafe inline, that's a, a no-op policy, essentially. So in 2014, people then realized, OK, we need to kind of somehow address this and enable the browser to distinguish between a script that was intended to be there by the developer versus injected by the attacker. And one idea that is now also implemented in CSP level two is to use nonces. Okay? So the idea is you have a nonce, a number used only once, very important, uh, should be random on every request. You put this into the, the CSP here in the script source, and then all inline scripts, actually all scripts in general, that have this nonce will be explicitly trusted. Okay? So an attacker can still inject a script tag, but they cannot guess the nonce, so there's nothing that they can do to, um, to exploit this. Yet, the developer themselves can add this nonce to every of their intended scripts. Sounds like a nice idea, seemingly making CSP more usable. That's great. However, there's still one problem that we have here. And this problem, as I told you earlier, add.com always includes company.com. But that's not realistic, right? If you think about real-time ad bidding and so on, you have double-click, and then once you visit a website, Today, once, it will show you BMW ads, next page reload, Mercedes ads, next page reload, Audi ads. So you can never, as the first party, who just says, hey, get double click, show me some ads, know exactly which scripts will be included. However, if your CSP blocks these scripts from Audi.com, you will not make any money, because that's the way that the advertising system works. And so to address this, CSP level three, which came out in 2016, introduced the concept of what is called strict dynamic. And with strict dynamic, a script that is already explicitly trusted by having a nonce 
will be allowed to programmatically add additional scripts. And you can see this up here, right? We programmatically create a new script element, then we set script source property here, add.com, add.js, and then document body append child. So this is programmatically adding a script. And now this script is also explicitly trusted, and then this can pass on the trust again by doing the same process again. So notably, because, and Sebastian said, uh, I should actually maybe change this 2016 to 2022, because the last major browser, namely Safari, finally implemented strict dynamic just six years after the, the specification was finalized for level three. And essentially, you will have browsers and, and users on your website that do not have a browser that's compatible with the latest version of CSP. So CSP is designed in a way that it's backwards compatible. So if here in level two, we have a nonce and we have unsafe inline, a level two browser will just say, okay, I'll ignore the unsafe inline because there's a nonce. A level one browser does not understand nonces, so it will see the unsafe inline, it's still working, right? So there's actually a lot of thought that was put into the standard by the, the developers of the standard to make sure it's backwards compatible and that these new levels try to really introduce or improve the usability of this mechanism. Okay, so with this in mind, let's have a look at the past. And as Markus mentioned, um, I've been here uh, a couple of times. And so I want to kind of take a look at some of uh, a short summary, essentially, of what we previously presented here on Ruasec. Now you could ask yourself, how do you actually look into CSP's evolution over time? So how do you travel back in time and then look at old data, old CSPs? And the answer is, well, I can't physically travel back in time, but I can do it virtually. And to do that, I can use what is called the Internet Archive. This is a service that has been up since 1996, I guess. And they archive, uh, so they regularly visit websites, right? Even top million websites or whatever. And then they take snapshots of this. Um, and this is really nice because A, it allows us to look at what Google looks like in 1999. But more importantly, they also archive all the headers that they saw at crawl time. So that means we can look at this Google website from 1999, look at the HTTP headers that we are being sent, and figure out which of those HTTP headers have this X archive auric prefix, because these are the ones that the crawler saw in 1999. So this really allows us to go back in time and look at how did CSP develop, how many websites picked up CSP, and for what use cases did they pick it up. And so if we look at this, we can see that this change in usability of CSP seemingly works, right? So we see a significant uptick here, and this was over 10,000 websites, so we had about 11% or so of the websites that had CSP at the end of our experiments. And you can see down here the levels. Um, and we classify a policy to be, for example, level three if it contains strict dynamic, okay? Because that's a feature that was only added in level three, so that's a level three policy. And so you could say, well, this, this works, right? It's, it's great. We have 10% of the top websites that deploy CSP, and more and more websites are deploying the newer features of CSP. So that's great. Seems to work. Perfect. And basically, now I could say, well, I'm done. Sebastian can talk about how easy it is to deploy CSP in practice, and we come back next year for uh, Rosec 2023. It's a little bit less easy than that, though, because if we take a closer look at CSP and the use cases, CSP not only constricts, uh, restricts scripts content, but also can be used for other things like framing control, you might have heard about the X-Frame options header, as well as TLS enforcement. And these features, unfortunately, were added in level two and level three. So if we actually look at the number of pages that make use for CSP for script content control, this is just a third of all the sites out there. So now we're down at like three, four percent of websites. Not great, but still seemingly there's an uptick. So this is going into the right direction, right? Perfect. Now we need to zoom in again on just those things that are uh, using script content control. And in CSP, there are various ways in which you can have an insecure policy, right? I already talked about unsafe inline. If you have that without nonsense, your CSP is entirely bogus, essentially. There's nothing in terms of security that you gain from this. But there are also other bad practices, like allowing everything as long as it's coming from an HTTPS URL. Um, in the times of Let's Encrypt, getting an HTTPS URL for an attacker is literally free, okay? 
And the third problem is you can also allow so-called data URIs, which is very similar to inline scripts. So essentially, these three things are bad. And if we look at the, in particular, the end here, yes, we see an uptick of people trying CSP for script content control, for XSS mitigation. Yet about 90% of them make use of unsafe inline. And if we sum these up in total, we have about 95% of all policies in the wild that actually are entirely meaningless for, for CSP, uh, for XSS mitigation. Sorry. So there is a very easy conclusion to this. More than 95% of all policies in the wild are entirely meaningless against XSS. So it's very easy to point here at those folks in the room that are developers themselves and say, OK, you screwed this up. Right? It's easy. We see it's make it made more usable every single iteration. Why don't you get your act together and just fix that stuff? But I'm not going to blame anybody here, because we asked ourselves something entirely different. We asked ourselves, is it really the first party, or is there maybe a third party roadblock in the way? And the key question that we asked here in this paper uh, presented by my, my student Marius, or my former student Marius Steffens, um, last year at NDSS, was whose behavior is it actually that interferes with CSP, right? Who, which JavaScript code actually does things that would be broken if a proper CSP would be deployed? And if you have the option, again, think about advertisements, you want to have a secure website, yes, but if your main source of income is advertisements, you're not going to break your advertisements. And so we ask ourselves, who requires unsafe inline? And who makes it also hard to keep a meaningful allow list of, uh, of, where, of hosts where data can be loaded from? And so to do that, we run a 12-week experiment of about uh, 10,000 sites on Trunco. And we collected who includes whom in these scripts and what do these parties actually do, right? Who uses uh, inline handlers and so on. And so the first problem of CSP, as I alluded to earlier, is unsafe inline. An unsafe inline is needed for two scenarios. The first one we already saw, this is the usage of inline scripts. Right? If you don't have a nonce, then you need to have unsafe inline, otherwise all inline scripts are forbidden. But the second thing is um, so-called event handlers. So to those people that have developed a web application, you know that you can define event handlers on, on elements, right? Um, for example, an on-click handler means if you click on a link, this is called an on-load handler for an image is, is triggered when the image has been loaded. An on-error handler for a script, for example, will be executed when the script fails to load. And while there is a good use case for this sometimes, where you want to have a button you can click on, this can also be abused by an attacker because an attacker could inject image source foo on error some payload. Right? Fail, image fails to load, and then the on error handler is called. But if we want to, just from a functionality point of view, enable these event handlers, there is nothing we can do except for adding unsafe inline or refactor the code. And so we looked into which parties add either event handlers or inline scripts. And it turns out that if we look um, at these numbers here, and we were able to crawl about 8,000 of these 10,000 sites, um, I just want to give you some of the, the highlights. So we can see that almost all of the pages which had some JavaScript will require unsafe inline, either by first or by third party code. If we now look here at the third party mandated way we have websites, which are forced by a third party to make use of unsafe inline. So even if they fix their own code base, their third parties would still block them from CSP in a meaningful way. We have about 6,000. And almost all of them, as you can see here, are because of these event handlers. Okay? For scripts, you could still add a nonce to them, but there is no such option in CSP to nonce an element. So essentially, 6,000 out of 8,000 sites in our data set are blocked and like literally harshly blocked from deploying CSP without unsafe inline. And now you could say, well, OK, maybe it's just it's double click. And then if they change double click for some other ad company, right, that should fix the problem. However, we looked also into websites that have more than one third party that blocks them from a meaningful CSP. And we see this is about 4,500 um, 
for, for the event handlers and in general. So it's not as easy as just ripping out one third party, sticking in another. You really need to change a lot your maps integrations, your analytics, your ad companies. This is the first problem. Now, another problem that you face with CSP is if you want to have this list of allowed hosts where, where scripts can be loaded from, then if your third parties frequently change from, which they from, from where they include content, you are screwed yet again, right? Because then you have to essentially every day check, is my CSP still loading all the advertisements? If not, add new host and go back and do the same thing the next day. And so we looked over time here on the 12-week the scale, and we actually saw, and I don't want to go into the details of the graph too much here, we saw that about 5,400 of these 8,000 sites add content from at least one previously unseen ETLD plus one, so a registrable domain, at least once. So that is even if you allow star.foo.com, you still in these 12 weeks, virtually like more than half of the sites still would need to add star.bar.com for, um, for getting their sites to still work. And 3,000 out of those uh, through actually third-party scripts. So we can see third parties play a very significant role in being a roadblock here. But you could now say, well, I remember earlier, he talked about level three. And this idea of strict dynamic, which uh, like solves this problem, right? Because with strict dynamic, easy enough, we just say, here's a nonce script. We give it strict dynamic, and then it can just add content from where it wants to, not blocked by the CSP. And it turns out that actually third parties mostly programmatically add new scripts. So in our data set, only 18% add scripts, of, 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 sorry, 18% of the sites have third party scripts which add additional scripts in an incompatible way. So that is 82% uh, would work. But now comes a tiny bit of a caveat. If you want to have strict dynamic, you need to kind of give the explicit trust to the first level of scripts, right? You have some script and you pass that a nonce. And remember what I said earlier about backwards compatibility. If you have nonces in your policy, unsafe inline is ignored. So the problem is, if we want to use strict dynamic, we cannot have unsafe inline, okay? because unsafe inline is overwritten by nonces, and nonces are required to work with strict dynamic. And now if we actually look at those pages that have only third parties that programmatically add additional scripts, and that would not require unsafe inline, remember two slides ago, we can actually see that about 76% of the sites cannot make use of strict dynamic, again, by the third parties. And so, as you can see here, it's very obvious that it's not as easy as to say, okay, everything is fine, um, developers will, uh, will get their act together. But we conducted in, a, in another study um, a developer survey, and we asked them, do you believe CSP is a viable option to improve your site's resilience against XSS attacks? And out of those people that responded, most of them said yes. So it seems like people believe in CSP and that it, it can actually work. However, when we asked them, would your scripts work out of the box if you deploy the script content restricting CSP? Most of them essentially said, no, we don't believe this is going to work. So essentially, I can now hand over to um, Sebastian and well, let him talk about that developers do want to deploy CSP. However, their senses do tell them to stop. <laughs> so, no. Yeah, also hi from my side. Um, what Ben showed you uh, up until now is was more uh, rather technical work about CSP. So we only uh, collected data and analyzed this data. But to promote changes uh, to CSP, for example, when talking to the W3C, so the folks that are creating those, the, the standards, for example, for CSP, we should promote uh, the, the changes on those APIs based on evidence and not based on assumptions that we took from the data that we gathered. And therefore, uh, and to, to get this evidence, uh, we actually asked 12 real-world developers in a semi-structured interview 
to tell us their horror stories about CSP deployment. Uh, during that interview, we uh, not only talked with them about CSP, but we also incorporated a drawing and a coding task to that interview to also get technical insight and a live view on how it is for developers to deploy CSP. Afterwards, uh, we transcribed those interviews to scientifically analyze them in an open coding process. And out of this open coding process, we then were able to get motivations to deploy CSP, strategies that people are applying on certain problems during CSP deployment, and of course, roadblocks of CSP. So let's directly go to the results here. Uh, one moti the motivations for CSP can be divided into two categories. Uh, on the one side, we have the original use case of CSP, so mitigating web-based attacks. And this does not only include uh, cross-site scripting, but also framing-based attacks via fra CSP framing sisters, or network-based attacks via upgrade and secure requests. But Attack mitigations were not the only motivations for companies. Many companies or many developers told us that in their company, they deployed CSP because they had a pen test uh, or a consulting at their company that told them that CSP is the, the hottest new shit out there. And also, they, they advertised it as an additional layer of sec security uh, such that if something happens and someone cuts himself with a knife, it can stop the bleeding. Um, we even had one participant that uh, said that they deployed CSP to act as a role model for other companies, such that they see, oh, this big company is using CSP, it must be cool stuff, so we also need to do it. Um, let, but let's take a look at the roadblocks. Um, and we, start, we, we got a broad vari variety of different roadblocks uh, and to, to well, show them to you, we start from the point of view of the average developer. And as you already have seen, CSP is a rather complex mechanism. And nobody of, no, of us knows everything. So we do what everyone would do in this case. We search for more information usually uh, uh, by using an online search engine. Uh, however, those information sources have uh, shown to either give uh, wrong suggestions or wrong ideas. Here we, for example, see a feature request to have a static nonsense. And as Ben already said, uh, a number used once should, well, not be a fixed value and should be random for every request. But we also saw uh, people that give wrong suggestions, for example, uh, using the unsafe inline keyword, which makes a policy trivially bypassable. Um, then our average developer starts working on an application, which is, in worst case, an already existing application with a lot of legacy code that includes uh, inline JavaScript or even inline events. And as Ben showed you, those are hard to get rid of or hard to allow via CSP. But a developer is also usually working for a company. And in this company, they, of course, have financial thoughts. And they want to have their secure CSP as fast as possible because time is money. But they also have different development teams, uh, like, for example, front and back-end team that are working on the web application. We had, for example, one participant uh, that explained to us that their marketing team is putting all, weir all of the weird JavaScript out there into their application, which completely screwed up with CSP. So you always had nearly daily meetings between the back-end team, who is responsible for the headers, and the uh, marketing team. 
But even uh, if all the stars align and you have a proper CSP for your code, there are third parties that can still screw up your CSP journey. And it's not only the third parties that Ben talked about, it's also about uh, framework support. For example, um, some web frameworks out there that are frequently used are not properly uh, implementing the usage of nonces. And even if they do, they have third-party plugins that are not supporting the usage of nonces, and then their scripts are not working. But it's not only the third parties uh, of the web application itself, it's also the browser vendors that might screw up uh, CSP. We have inconsistencies in uh, the features of CSP that are implemented. We have inconsistencies in how those features are implemented. Uh, we have inconsistent console messages and, and many more things that, are, are, that browsers screw up. Uh, for example, uh, we have the problem of strict dynamic. At the time of this study, uh, it was not supported by Safari. In the meanwhile, they have, I think in the meanwhile, it's not only a plan to be in the next version, it's actually implemented in the current version. So in the meanwhile, this problem of strict dynamic not being implemented in one of the major browsers is fixed. However, we still have inconsistent console messages that makes the life of the developer harder than it should be. Um, for example, if you have an inline script in Firefox, it's just saying, yeah, uh, you have a problem with your CSP because you have somewhere inline a script. Happy hunting. And Chrome is also not saying in which line the problem is, but is at least giving you, uh, telling you what you can do and even providing you the hash that you can put in your CSP to allow this script. But there are many more inconsistencies uh, between how certain things are implemented in, in browsers, for example, handling of WebSockets and so on. But it's not only the browsers themselves that uh, make CSP deployment hard. It's also, uh, so not only the vi uh, variety of different browsers out there, but also many different extensions that might be installed in all of the client's browsers. Uh, for example, imagine an uh, extension that injects inline, script, inline scripts into a web application would screw up with every policy that is not allowing inline, inline scripts. And uh, CSP has a reporting functionality to get messages, debug messages, uh, violation reports. And usually, you have a lot of false positives in those uh, violation reports because all these different extensions that are screwing up CSP uh, then send reports to the actual developer who, and it's an extremely hard task to distinguish between an, uh, a violation report that is caused by the application itself or a violation report that is caused because some extension or plugin or browser feature is violating CSP. Um, also, an important point that some uh, participant mentioned here is you should not host the uh, report endpoint that is gathering the violation reports on the same machine as the application itself, because as soon as there is some problem and millions of clients are causing those violation reports, you effectively DDoS yourself by, uh, by getting a, a shitload of different uh, violation reports. But let's come to the strategies, how we can at least mitigate the effect of those uh, roadblocks. We have strategies for the initial deployment. Um, we have seen uh, as a best practice, start, uh, developers starting with a strict, very strict CSP, so script source none, for example, and then adding to the allow list of CSP uh, every 
script that needs to be allowed. But we have also seen people that have started with a lex CSP, so for example, uh, allowing all HTTPS uh, URLs as well as all inline scripts, and then, well, getting stricter throughout the development process. And we have also seen that, they are, that many developers are using tools that are available to uh, ease the deployment process of CSP. For, uh, there's also something that we, we dubbed uh, deployment principles, so uh, how the developers behave during the, uh, during the deployment process, and most of our participants used one general, one global CSP for the whole web application, which is easy, because you only need to deploy and also maintain one header. But we have also seen uh, a few using a different CSP for every page, because every HTML page might have different JavaScripts that are loaded there. And uh, we have also seen the practice of field testing. So uh, not only testing the application in a test environment, but deploying a new CSP header or hardened, hardenized CSP header uh, in the report-only mode to get uh, yeah, feedback or violation reports from real-world uh, usage of the application. But something that was in common uh, across all our interviews was that for most, if not all companies, uh, functionality is way more important than security which is under, which, uh, be because as Ben already mentioned, uh, many web applications are getting their money from, well, either being used like Airbnb <laughs> or from providing advertisements. And if the actual functionality isn't working, there is no money. So security will also not help here. We have also seen uh, different strategies in how you can solve the, the roadblocks that we, uh, we have seen earlier. On the one hand, we have the big problem of inline JavaScript. And although some of the participants used hashes or nonces to allow the execution of those scripts, some uh, externalized the scripts. So taking the, the source code that is within the uh, script uh, text and moving it to an external self-hosted script such that it is no, no longer an inline script but rather counts as allowed because it is uh, it falls under the, the safe uh, self uh, source expression. A similar uh, picture is seen for inline events. However, for inline events, the usage of nonces is not an option because nonces can only be put on script tags, but not on, for example, anchor elements or buttons that have an on-click handler. Uh, here, many of the developers uh, also externalize the events by uh, writing, by programmatically adding uh, the, this event, for example, an on-click event, to the button in an external JavaScript, which is then, well, again, allowed by, for example, the self-source expression. But we also had one participant that used the rather new and still not good supported unsafe hashes directive, uh, which allows you to also uh, add code hashes for inline event handlers to the CSP in order to allow their execution. Then we had the big problem uh, that Ben already showed, uh, third party code. And uh, because some of our participants didn't trust the CDNs that we used in our uh, sample application, uh, some of the participants uh, self-hosted the libraries instead of loading them via a CDN. However, uh, th while this might work for libraries, it does 
not work for dynamic scripts like those that you get back, for example, from your advertisement vendor. Uh, <laughs> for some libraries that we used, we, for example, used in the uh, application jQuery, some of the developers also uh, removed the dependency on jQuery in order to, well, completely get rid of the library. <laughs> and while the majority used uh, domain or host-based uh, allow listing to allow the third parties, some also used nonces to allow the execution of third-party code. Yeah, uh, now that we have seen the, the history of CSP and also the current state, how the developers see CSP, what are the plans for the future? Well, first of all, why does CSP fail at the moment? Um, one big problem of CSP is that it is very complex at the moment. And uh, therefore, and the information sources are not good. Therefore, CSP and developers seem to be natural enemies. Another big roadblock for a sane CSP deployment are third parties. And yeah, Ben <laughs> very much explained to you why, certain, uh, why and how third parties screw up with sane CSP deployment. But also inline code and inline hashes make the life of the developer harder than it need to be. And also the inconsistent CSP implementation uh, of different browser vendors and extensions and so on makes it even worse for the developers. So uh, as, you, as you see, CSP has a bad name and also the uh, standard has still room for improvement, I would say, and the idea how we can address at least some of those failures of CSP is that we need to have way better support for developers. For example, in uh, IDEs, an IDE could, for example, uh, notify the developer to, hey, don't use inline event, you're typing an inline event handler here, please add this programmatically in order to be still easily CSP compliant later on. Or uh, those uh, IDEs might maintain a, a list of script origins that might be uh, prone to, for example, JSONP bypasses of, of CSP. And as soon as you start including that script, an IDE could warn you about, hey, if you are using this, you are it, it, your CSP cannot be secure. And also, uh, we need to somehow convince third parties that their, sh their code should be CSP compliant. Because at the moment, uh, for third parties, it's not a problem at all if they are not compliant. For example, uh, Twitter, uh, the, the Twitter widget, is not compliant. However, it, uh, Twitter itself has a sane CSP because their widgets are only used by third parties and they don't care about third parties. So we need to, for example, to convince advertisement vendors, we need to uh, have an incentive by, for example, hiding um, the, I think, Flock is the, the new Google ad tracking API thingy. Uh, for example, hiding the usage of this new API uh, in a way that it is only possible for CSP compliant uh, scripts to use it. However, those are rather political issues because you need to uh, convince the, the W3C to enforce this, um, or at least browser vendors, which and it's not usually not in their in incentive to have those rather restrictive access to, to APIs. But maybe some of you want to deploy CSP. And let's talk about how we can start with that. Well, usually you should start with a report-only policy, because report-only policy 
are only reporting but not enforcing the CSP, so you cannot destroy functionality at that point. You should try to use a non-spaced CSP because those are easier to deploy usually because you don't need to take care of all the new hosts that are added. As long as every script tag has a proper nonce, it will work. And if need to be, because your, for example, advertisement vendor needs to have it in order to work, we have, you can then use strict dynamic. For new applications, it's important that they are an integral part of development from the beginning, such that uh, you, the, the uh, bad practices that Ben showed you with uh, inline scripts and inline events and so on will never occur during that development. And also, it's important to choose your third parties with care. Uh, the tool that it was actually used to uh, gather all the data that Ben showed to you uh, is available online. So you can, for example, use this uh, tool uh, dubbed Smurf to check third parties for their compliance. And for existing web applications, we uh, encourage you to resolve the issues step by step. Um, for time reasons, I will probably uh, skip over this, uh, uh, the explanation of this uh, rather big graph, but uh, it's basically that you uh, don't, it's basically a help for developers such that they are not overwhelmed by all the error reports that are occurring if you start with deploying CSP. But if you already have a CSP and uh, you, you are on, uh, and if it is a sane CSP, you are one of the few that actually managed to deploy CSP. But we want to encourage you to take the next step, hardening your CSP. Why? Well, uh, if you have a host-based whitelist, um, research throughout the last 10 years, <laughs> roughly have shown that host-based uh, li host allow lists are bypassable. Because of JSONP endpoints that reflect code, because of script gadgets in libraries that are hosted on, the, uh, on those uh, endpoints, open redirects, and a plethora of other ways how host-based uh, lists can be bypassed. But also nonces are not uh, invincible. They uh, if you, for example, have this script tag and the injection point uh, where you can inject markup via cross-site scripting is right before that script tag. An attacker can steal or, in this case, rather reuse the nonce by injecting, for example, uh, this script tag. Now, because uh, this opening, uh, this, this start string character ends after the source attribute of the next script tag. Uh, and because HTML parsers are error tolerant, it will ju just ignore the benign JS stuff that is there. Our script tag with attacker.com reuses the nonce that was already there for the benign script. And yeah, then an attacker might still load his own code to do shenanigans on the web application. So, if you already deployed one of those policies, it's a good idea to also uh, include the other kind of policy. So, if you have already non-spaced, also deploy a second CSP that is host-based. And why this is working is that if there are two policies, they need to be both enforced. For example, we have here a CSP with a nonce and also a CSP that allows uh, the origin itself and advertisement.com. And now only scripts that have a nonce and are originating from one of those sources can be executed. So, a way to go even beyond that improvement is the newest addition to CSP, which is not widely supported yet, um, trusted types. It is basically an API to protect client-side syncs, 
such as uh, eval in HTML and so on, such that we can not only mitigate server-side cross-site scripting, but also client-side cross-site scripting. Um, here, the developers don't need to create lists from sources that are allowed, but need to write sanitizer functions that filter out the malicious content and leave in the benign. To see if this new and, and still work in progress API is uh, working, uh, we actually need your help if you are a developer, because after doing all those research about CSP, we also want to do research about trusted types to see whether this new API is repeating the issues that CSP had. And uh, therefore, if you are a developer and interested in helping us in our study, uh, visit survey.swag.cispa.zaland or scan this QR code and fill out a short survey to be in our participant list. So what are the key takeaways from this talk? CSP can uh, stop the pleading if all third parties are played by the rules, so if all our third parties are CSP compliant, and if we finally have better support for developers, like, for example, that uh, IDE support that I mentioned, such that issues such as the one that, that we have seen in this talk does not occur. Still open problems is uh, how can we support developers, because now, with this IDE thingy, we have again uh, only assumptions how we think it might improve uh, the support, uh, the, the, or ease the deployment, but we need to still scientifically evaluate if it is actually working that way. And we also want to evaluate how we can improve or redesign entire mechanisms in order to be uh, more secure and easier to use. Uh, yeah, with that, I want to finish for today. And uh, as said, we need help for our studies. And thanks for your attention. Feel free to ask questions or discuss about uh, CSP, cross-site scripting, and all the topics around it. Thank you.